The economists gave us that benchmark. This is supposed to be about creating a scope of work so that the economists can move forward. As I said, this does not have to be a final vote. We've been told all along that the urgency today is to get benchmarks to the economists. That's what this vote is about. Not the 2.6 million capture of all the uh, uh, individuals that uh, Dr. Scott Lewis is trying to target. I mean, isn't, doesn't that capture everybody in the lineage base? Wouldn't that capture them? We're giving them special consideration first on the food chain for reparations and then, you know, desegregating out after that? I just want to be clear. I, I just... You're the maker of the motion, so I just wanted to make sure amending that, does that not still capture all the folks that would fall under lineage base? So what it would do is it would maintain what we can think of as a status quo of how, how blackness is identified and calculated in the state. Meaning, you're using effectively a racist model for identifying a group of people. That's right. That's right. Without actually giving that group of people the terms by which they can identify themselves. And so, in principle, you know, the question you pose, you know, it's a, it's, it's, it's one that I really can't answer, because to say yes would mean that I am also subscribing to that model, and I don't. What I'm saying is that to be black and to be black with a heritage that comes out of the period of enslavement in this country is a very specific thing. It is a very specific group of people and it is on the basis of the injuries of those people that the bill is asking for us to come up with a, a remedy of, of reparation. So you're saying that number would be smaller than 2.6 million? Presuming that everybody who can somehow to answer your question, I would say yes, likely yes. I don't know. I'm not a census worker. I don't know, right? Who was on the other the other side of filling out the form? But I would presume yes, right? But if you think about the waves of if you think about the waves of 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 immigrants to the state, if you think about the refugeeism in the 90s to the state. Right. There's a question as to how are Ethiopian and Eritrean second generation, right? Meaning first generation born. Uh, 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 how are they identifying themselves? But so what does it mean again, I, 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 I don't see how and, broadening the pool then narrow. I, I thought we look at all African Americans. This is why I'm interpreting mm -hmm. as a person okay. who looks at it. We look, we're looking at, except the fact there's 2.6 million Cal, uh, African Americans in California. Of that 2.6 million, we will give special consideration to those folks with special lineage consideration based on your language again, does that, you know, of African-American descendants of slavery, does that not capture? So to go back to my original point, when I asked uh, member Holder about her amended, her amended motion, we have the, her, her amended motion doesn't actually do any, any further clarifying work. The AB 3121 introductory language already says African Americans with special consideration. If that were if that were the definition, then we wouldn't be asked in the following lines to actually identify who's eligible. So that means that the the expectation of determining eligibility moves past just that generic language of African Americans with special consideration. Because if that were the task, then we wouldn't actually be asked to identify who is eligible. So my view is, well, okay, I understand what you're saying, and I understand the logic. If you just say all black people, then you, yes, logically, within all black people, the universe of all black people, there will be lineage-based black people, right? To use that language just conveniently. The point is that the job, right, is to go and actually define. So if, if member holder, or if you, Senator Bradford, explain to me what special consideration actually means, Right. That would actually give me some sense of, of, of what of what is being proposed here. But what's being proposed is simply a reproduction of the generic language, which is only the starting point based upon our, our duties. OK, so then my question for you, since you've been 
interfacing with the economists is. Didn't the economists ask us to give them a benchmark so that they can move forward with their calculation? And isn't 2.6 million African Americans a benchmark for them to so, move forward with their calculations? So, so member holder, the, the economists, the, what the economists shared is not prescriptive for us in the way that we are meant to take it to make our decisions. We asked the economists for some sense of what they were thinking. Now, if we choose to take it up and to, and to you know, move ahead with it, that is what I guess we're deliberating now. But they are not expecting us to take their, their, their recommendations or their statements of 2.6 black people because that's the generic recommendation. That's what's available to them. It's our job to actually come back with a more refined sense of what we're talking about. Or alternatively, we can just take what they've asked for, I mean, what they provided, but that's not what they've asked for from us. So the only reason why we have this PowerPoint, to be fair, is because we asked for it. The economists did not want to offer up this amount of information. They wanted to take their direction wholly from us and then go away. The only reason why we have this is because we asked for it, because we were unwilling to make the decision ourselves last time. But ultimately, it sounds like what you're saying is that the only thing, the only decision that is available to us is an exclusively lineage-based decision. An, an exclusive, I'm, not, I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that's all that's available to us. Benchmark, because you're saying that the, you can't use the 2.6 million as a benchmark because it's not specific enough. And so the only thing available is the lineage-based. I mean, what we are trying to do is create an amendment to your proposal, which clearly was problematic for many of us, and so we couldn't move forward. So this is the amendment. Let's vote on it. Well, no, because what Let's I'm asking go is ahead and vote clarification on. of what special consideration means. So I don't, I, I'm not saying that the only thing, listen, I have my view, my view is lineage, right? That's why I put forward the motion. What I'm saying is that my problem with your amendment and why I find your amended motion problematic is does it actually provide any further clarification than the generic language of AB 3121. So to give you a bit of insight into the conversations that Chair Moore and I had with the economists, we were very, clear to them about where we were in terms of where we thought the debate would end up with a race versus lineage uh, consideration. So what we discussed with them and what they agreed to do in principle, if it were in fact advanced, was that we would take a lineage based model and then apply it to the various incidences of injury in the state of California. That was one. So if we had gotten to that conversation today, that would have been what was discussed. So, for example, if you qualify based upon the, the category that I put forward in my motion, this lineage-based um, uh, model, and then you also happen to be in the state of California during the pioneer period, and then during the period of um, urban renewal and Jim Crow segregation, and during the period of mass incarceration, you would then have these further refinements of your eligibility. But what they wanted to know was who were the effective universe of eligible persons who could then be further defined, right, based upon, and this is only a consideration, based upon the various incidences of injuries that took place in the state of California. So what I'm saying is that if you're trying to advance in your amendment this 2.6 million, that's fine. What I'm asking for, meaning I don't agree with it, but what I'm saying, it's fine for you to do that. But as a member of the task force, what I'm asking for is further clarification about the special consideration, because it, it, it means nothing more than it meant to us in June of, of last year, when we first talked about the question of special consideration and what it meant. And this is why we had Shirley Weber come to talk to us a few meetings ago, because we couldn't, we couldn't understand, or we couldn't come to terms on what special consideration meant. Shirley Weber came and told us, it meant African-Americans descended of slavery. She told us that. We asked for clarification, she provided it to us. And this is why I based my motion the way that I did. Okay, but people were not satisfied with the motion. 
that that you crafted. That, so now I'm trying, I'm trying to put forward an fine. amendment that gives a broader universe, a more inclusive universe for purposes of eligibility. And you're saying I understand, I understand that. So so but what I'm saying is that the bottom line is is this an amendment that we can vote on? Or is there something I don't understand that makes it impossible for this to be the amended language? So I'll, I'll repeat myself again then. The reason why I find it problematic is that it does not actually clarify anything beyond the generic instruction of AB 3121, which also mandated us with further defining the community of eligibility. What I want to know, member holder, is that when you say special consideration, what does that mean? That's right. Because if we go to the if we go to the town, if we go to the economists with this with this motion, how are they meant to factor in the special consideration? What does that mean? A ten percent increase on whatever injury uh, model we're creating? Is it a fifty percent uh, increase of, of of harm? And that's why, just from a practical standpoint, the lineage argument made sense to me. Right. And I'm saying this as a person, right, who really has no dog in this fight in that regard. Okay, I think Member so, Tamaki has his hands up. And so the point is, is that special consideration needs to be actually defined for it to be remotely useful. May I make a comment? Member Tamaki, you're recognized. So, you know, I throw this out there to be responded to by uh, Member Holder and Professor Scott Lewis and of course everybody else, but I'm trying to stitch together two concepts. And one is to be specific enough. I think Professor Scott Lewis has a point about not providing any greater clarity than what we had before. But then I think Professor uh, Member Holder has a point of leaving it broad enough that some of these other harms can be addressed. So how about this? And maybe this is too simplistic, but it starts with um, uh, Jovan Scott Lewis's main motion, which let me just read it again, although it's on the screen. Define the community of eligibility based on lineage determined by an individual being an African-American descendant of chattel enslaved person or the descendant of a free black person living in the US prior to the end of the 19th century. And then I would add to address my concern that I articulated earlier, with clarification that such motion doesn't preclude the task force from making recommendations to address anti-black practices and policies. And what do I mean by that? Well, things like maybe the California legislature should consider legislation reverse the effects of anti-black housing discrimination policies. Um, we talked about Allensworth. We talked about many other things in terms of uh, employment and um, criminal justice. So those are the kinds of things that I want to make sure that the task force is also addressing those things at the same time that we acknowledge and recognize a specific class of victims uh, resulting from chattel slavery. Is that narrow enough? Is that specific enough? And then also create an avenue to deal for the task force to deal with these other issues. Uh, if I, I, I respectfully, uh, Member Tamaki, I would I would disagree with that with that articulation. I, I honestly, I, I think that I think that how we understand from the economists. Member there's Holder, please, please, can you please stop? Can Member Holder, I mean, can Member Tamaki restate simply um, what you're proposing? And then I'll go to member holder. I could restate it. I mean, conceptually, I'm trying to knit together two concepts that now are being treated as mutually exclusive. 
and one concept is to recognize a distinct specific class of harmed individuals. The other concept is to have the task force address the continuing harm of anti-black hatred and its consequences. And they're, they're, two, they're related, but they're two different things. One has to do with compensating and acknowledging and providing an identity for a distinctly harmed American group of people. And the other one has to do with dealing with the continuing infection and pathology of ongoing anti-black hatred, which is not necessarily lineage based. So <clears throat> the intention was to take Professor Scott Lewis's motion and simply add on. And he defines a community of eligibility based on lineage um, to descendants of enslaved persons or free black people living in the US prior to the end of the 19th century. And then the addition is with clarification. Again, this is make sure that we're not, it's not mutually ex exclusive. With clarification that such motion doesn't preclude the task force from making address, making recommendations to address anti-black practices and policies. And <clears throat> again, I refer to our 600 page report that we're gonna release in June. And so much of it has to do with re recommendations that I hope we would make dealing with each of these subject matters of housing, uh, employment, political disenfranchisement, and so on. Uh, Madam Chair. Yes. Madam Vice, Chair. Yes, Vice Chair Brown, you're recognized. I see a raise the question. Does this task force feel the moral obligation for us to lay a solid foundation or do we wish to set up ourselves with what I call cotton candy politicalization it, 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 it confuses me you're in a state well, the black population is only about five to six percent. You're in a state where there was a 209 and has not been successful at all in terms of repealing it. You're in a state. Well, we have to be practical servants trying to deliver for the people. I don't purport to know all things, but the way I see this going, we're setting ourselves up for another study. The Ghana murder all of them. Another study. The current commission report, another study that was represented in Andrew Hacker's book, Two Nations Divided and Unequal and Hostile. Is that what we want to be known for, another study? Are we going to give a basic plan to hold this state accountable, to do something, to pay back, to give release for those descendants of chattel slavery who are still there in that state of California. Please, 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 I beg us tonight, take the first step. 
And if God gives us the grace to still be around here, get someone, raise up somebody else who will deal with the additional things that we are talking about. This is an eternal struggle. There's no sprint. It's a relay. Thank you, Vice Chair Brown. I'll just say quickly, and then I'll go to Member Holder. I think Don, Member Tamaki, I think there might be a misunderstanding on your part in terms of what the mission of this task force is as it's outlined in the statute. And anti-Black discrimination is nowhere in the statute. Yes, it talks about de facto um, and de jure discrimination, but it's, but it's talking about de facto and de jure discrimination and contemporary harms as it's applied to a specific group of people. And they do not say black people. They see they say freed African slaves and their descendants. That's very clear in the statute. Also in terms of the apology, it's asking California to draft an apology to free slaves, African slaves and their descendants. It's not saying to all black people. So how can we as a task force say that we wanna give reparations to people that we're not even apologizing to <laughs> because that's not prescribed in the statute. I see your point in connection with compensation in particular. You know, I I, I see your point. But what I I'm concerned about, what, what I'm concerned about also, if you can just let me finish on this point, Camila, <clears throat> is what about the Fillmore that was relocating 20,000 people, wiped out, 900 black businesses. What about the redlining that created the, you know, the areas that are most polluted and most impoverished? I think the task force certainly addresses those things in its report. And I think that we have something to say about that. And I think that doesn't preclude at all the reparations portion, in particular compensation to uh, descendants of American slavery. So <clears throat> I'm, have, I'm struggling with how to reconcile those two things. Um, and I don't see them as mutually ex exclusive. So if, if, if you think that's off base, uh, you know, please help me understand that. Madam Chair, may I speak? This is Brother Since he invoked uh, the film movie. Yeah. We have a a local task force on reparations. We are addressing the field more. I'm very well conversed in that. We got to brighten the corner where we are. We got to give emergency treatment to where it is needed. That's what we need to do. And then the, the, the last point that I wanted to raise, well, actually, let's go to Member Holder. Go ahead, Member Holder. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's 6.30 and we have to take a vote. And I think that um, the, the language in the original motion was unsatisfactory. And so I've tried to amend it to respond to the concerns about making making it too exclusionary so this broadens it Our, and and now th this process is being blocked and i feel like we're being told that no we're not going to accept any amendment that broadens it <laughs> can we vote <coughs> on the amended version for my part, member holder, I'm not trying to block it. I'm asking for further clarification on what you mean by special consideration, and I haven't been given an answer yet. What I will do is I will share an email that Chair Moore and I, as um, advisory group members to The Economist, just received um, from uh, Garrity and Mullins. Um, and it reads, Dear Chair Moore and member Scott Lewis, guidance on the benchmark from the reparations task force can include direction to do our calculations based upon a subset 
of the 2.6 million. There's nothing sacred about the 2.6 million figure. We used it for illustrative purposes. We also illustrated in our PowerPoint what might be done with an estimated 2 million who are Black American descendants of US slavery. And so, this, and I, and I, and I mean, I can add that to the, the chat if it's helpful. Um, so again, that 2.6 million, as I mentioned earlier, was not meant to be prescriptive from the economist. It was used for illustrative purposes in the absence of clear guidance from us about which community we were talking about. But in effect, that is saying that the only language that will be acceptable for purposes of a vote is if we have 2 million. We can't use the broader 2.6 million. And, and may I add something? I've been raising my hand for a while here. And member girls, you're recognized. Mm -hmm. So it, it, we're talking about two classes of people and two uh, important for, forms of harm that, and those two forms of harm were specified in the bill. It's about what happened for those of yeah. our, those of us who were um, our descendants Hello? of the yes, I met yeah. and yes, who is this? Guys, and you have to turn off your yes. Can I help you? What is it? Um, I'm Karen Johnson. You're not on mute. Up on mute, please. Thank you. I lost my train of thought. So anyway, that, that we're talking about two classes of harm that the bill said we needed to take a look at and the reality is that the legacy of the enslavement period impacts all black people in california that our findings have clearly illustrated and so is there a way to think about this community of eligibility with the special consideration meaning that we and, and now I actually think we're starting to get into forms of reparation and that that's where the special consideration will then need to be further defined. But that for folks who are direct descendants, that there, there are certain forms of reparations that are dedicated specifically to them. And that then those who have been harmed by anti-Blackness, which is the legacy of enslavement, that casts a net that is broad enough to include everybody black, no matter where you came from or when you came, but that you are here, then those calculations are based on the broader 2.6 million. But it does seem like, um, member Scott Lewis, that you're taking us a little bit ahead in, in further defining the special consideration into the forms of reparations. Yes, respectfully, member girls, what you and member holder are outlining is outside of the scope of the statute and what member Jovan Scott Lewis moved and uh, member Scott Montgomery stepped properly seconded is in alignment or is within the scope of the statute. I just want to continue to make that clear. I referenced in my presentation at least four different statutory provisions that reference the lingering negative effects on slavery which requires the task force to study and develop reparations proposals on the lingering negative effects of slavery against freed African slaves and their descendants, nobody else. So to the, to the point of the report, the 600 page report, not only are we discussing freed African slaves and, the, and their descendants, we have some information in there about Native Americans and indigenous original peoples. We have information on there about Asian Americans, Latino Americans, and the harms they endured in California, but we're not mandated to create reparations proposals for those groups. <laughs> the, the statute tells us that we need to develop reparations proposals as it pertains to freed African slaves and their descendants who were deemed United States citizens from 1868 to present. When it talks about the lingering negative effects and legacy of slavery, it particularizes it to a particular group, which is freed African slaves <laughs> So again, the original motion is in complete alignment with the statute, and the amended motion is outside of the scope of the statute. So in order to have reconsideration of the original motion, what must what must we do? That's the pleasure. 
I, I, we're going back and forth on this, so we we have to do something. And I can parliamentarian. Can I have a question for the parliamentarian Johnson. Um, 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 is is can is can we call for call the question on the amended? Yes, you need to get a second. Did did you get it? Oh yeah, you did. You did. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can. Someone can call the question. Then you would vote on the question. Two thirds majority to end debate, and then you move to the amendment. And you vote on the amendment. Or no. Okay. That's right. So this has all been a discussion of your of the seconded motion, Lisa. Right. Okay. So then that's, I'm. So that's so that's why I was asking for further clarification on special consideration, because I was participating in the discussion about your about your motion. Uh, understood. And and I think that um, Professor Grills responded to that. I agree that calling for further clarification on special consideration. Is takes us further down the line um, into the forms of reparations. I think for purposes of the scope of work for the economists so that they can get going, the 2.6 million benchmark gives a broad and inclusive uh, benchmark for beginning the calculations. I'm going to ask to call the question. Wait, did you have to request? So did did you answer the question in terms of because he asked repeatedly in terms of what special consideration means in this particular amendment? That's right because you're you're you are using the language in your motion for defining the community of eligibility, right? So it, I can't be kicking I can't be extending, you know, my interest into actual proposals for recommendation. By way of my interest in what in, in having special consideration defined when it's you who've added the special consideration language to it. Which is meant to help us define this community of eligibility. So what I want to know, because you put it in your motion is that what does the special consideration mean when you're talking about the community of eligibility. Would it clarify to take the word special out and have lineage considerations? Because is it the word special that is? It's, 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 it's consideration. It's special, it's special consideration, it's consideration. Because what is the consideration around eligibility? Meaning you're recognizing that it's a thing that exists and that we may need to pay attention to. I don't know. I understand what you're saying and what member Grills is saying that when we're thinking about, okay, there is a portion of money that's called reparations. We're going to give special consideration to uh, lineage based African Americans, right? And, and to, 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 to refer back to Senator Bradford's um, comment, that may mean special consideration looks like going to the front of the line, right? To use Senator Bradford's uh, uh, language. But when we're defining eligibility, I don't, I can't understand what special consideration means within the very specific task of defining eligibility. I don't know what work it actually does in defining eligibility. Okay, so perhaps we can say with an understanding that there will be uh, lineage-based considerations determined by lineage-based considerations or lineage based eligibility is i mean it's almost like you're asking uh, member lewis that we start specifying things so one of the things that came to mind as as you're asking for this clarification is are we saying that um, there's a special lineage consideration meaning primacy is given to direct descendants when it comes to cash payments, that, that that is reserved for them. And that then the anti-Black harms is open to the 2.6 million as we look at 
individual and or structural or systemic strategies for reparation? Respectfully, Member Grills, your anti-Black harms is not in the statute. Okay. So that, that, well, the, but, but as an, as an example, though, if I, if I may, if I may. The legacy of enslavement, that is in the statute. As it pertains to freed African slaves and their descendants. Who were deemed United States president? Who were deemed United States citizens from 1868 to present? So essentially, Member Holder and Member Grills, you all are asking for the statute to be rewritten to include other groups and to include anti-Black discrimination. That's what you're asking for. I, that needs to be very clear. I, th I think they disagree with, and so do I, with your interpretation of the no. bill as an author of the bill. So I, I think that's part of the, the back and forth, Madam Chair, that sure, um, your sure, interpretation um, is being, not being challenged, but has a differing understanding. And, th and that's why we keep going back and forth. Madam Parliamentarian, can um, we have reconsideration on the motion? On which motion? On the amendment? On the first, on the first motion. Well, there's, amend <clears throat> there's an amendment. Not while there's an amendment pending. So we, we need to vote up or down the amendment? Yes, and then you can go back to the main Call motion. Call for the question. I thought it was already called. Do they need a second? So we at least Yes, you need a second. That. A second. Interim. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, this is the vote on the call Call of the question, call for the question, the previous question. Uh, Chair Moore? Aye. Vice Chair Brown? What are we voting on? The call of the question, the call, call the previous question uh, on what, the amendment. What Restate on the, the amendment. motion. Restate the amendment. Restate the amendment, please. Okay, this is to end debate on the amendment. And then we right. have the end of the debate. Yes. 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 And, uh, yes. Vice Chair Brown, did you have any further questions of me? No, I'm, I'm saying if this is up to end the debate, my yeah. vote is yes. <laughs> is yes. Thank you. That's right. Member Bradford. Purposes of ending the debate, yes. Aye. Thank you. Member Grills. Aye. Member Holder. Aye. Member Jones Sawyer. Aye. Member Lewis. Aye. Member Tamaki. Aye. Member Montgomery Stepp. Aye. Thank you. <clears throat> Madam Chair, there were nine mem members voting. There were nine ayes and zero nays to end debate. Thank you. So the debate has ended. Um, and so the amendment's already on the floor. It's been properly moved and seconded. So Parliamentarian Johnson, um, please um, do a roll call vote on the amendment on the floor. And again, the amend the amended amend sorry, the amendment is define the community of eligibility to be consistent with the 2.6 million African Americans in the state of California, with an understanding that there will be special lineage considerations determined by an individual being an African-American descendant of chattel enslaved person or the descendant of a free black living in the United States prior to the end of the 19th century. Parliamentarian Johnson. Thank you. <clears throat> Chair Moore. No. Vice Chair Brown. No. Member Bradford. Abstain. Member Grills. Aye. Member Holder. Member Holder, I can't see you. I'm sorry. Aye. Can you hear me? Aye. Thank you. 
Uh, Member Joan Sawyer. Aye. Member Lewis. No. Member Tamaki. Abstain. Member Montgomery Stepp. No. Madam Chair, there were nine members voting. There were three ayes, four nays, and two abstentions. So the motion fails. Now we'll go back to the original motion on the floor. Sorry, go ahead. Okay. The original motion. Okay. Um, I'm going to call the roll for the original motion as stated at the top of the page. Uh, Chair Moore. Okay. Vice Chair Brown. Aye. Member Bradford. Aye. Member Grills? No. Member Holder? No. I'm sorry? No. I'm sorry. Member Holder voted yes. Aye? No. She voted no. <laughs> Thank you. Member Holder voted no. Nay. Uh, Member Jones Sawyer? Member Joan Sawyer? Oh. I'm sorry, I've, the paper is hiding you all, so I can't see if you can I speak. I said no. Thank you. Member Lewis, I'm sorry, Member Aye. Joan Sawyer voted no. Uh, Member Lewis? Aye. Member Lewis voted aye. Member Tamaki? No. Member Tamaki voted nay. Uh, Member Montgomery Step. Aye. Member Montgomery Step voted aye. Um, Madam Chair, there were uh, nine members voting. Five members voted aye. And four members voted uh, nay. Thank you. There are nine members voting, five members voted aye, four members voted nay. Uh, the ayes have it and the motion carries. So the community of eligibility will be based on lineage determined by an individual being an African-American descendant of a chattel enslaved person or the descendant of a free black person living in the United States prior to the end of the 19th century. And we will use this community of eligibility standard to um, instruct the economic consultant team with next steps. Thank you. Okay, so we will now move to the next item on the agenda, which we know has been tabled right until tomorrow. Um, Attorney Newman, Parliamentarian Johnson, are they still here or <laughs> are we're moving to, to, to discuss it tomorrow, right? It was it was tabled till tomorrow. Okay, great. All right, let me go back to my agenda. All right, so that concludes our um, agenda today, and we will recess until tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Thank you, esteemed task force members. Uh, thank you to DOJ staff. Thank you to the members of the public and the press who have endured technical difficulties throughout the day. Really appreciate it. And we will recess until tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Thank you. <laughs>